Uh, what's that? What's that noise? I I think it's music. Music. Yeah, it it is music. Oh my God, Andrew, is that is that our music? Yeah, I I think it is. That's our music. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Andrew, this means we're back. We're back, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Open Door Philosophy, a podcast where an undergraduate philosophy major and his former high school philosophy teacher discuss a variety of philosophical topics in an understandable way, all towards the purpose of living a good life, representing Plato's form of the beautiful. I'm your host, Derek Parsons. In wondering if I can ever know what it's like to be a bat, I'm your host, Andrew Graziano. Welcome to Season 2, everyone. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 1, where we're going to begin a short series on what's referred to in philosophy as the mind-body problem, but it's about consciousness. But first, before we get all to that good stuff, we got to do a catch-up because it's been a few months. Andrew, how has life been? Life has been pretty good. I just moved back into school and started a few weeks ago. It's been pretty good. My schedule is pretty overloaded, but I'm taking classes that I pretty much all enjoy. Other than that, life has been pretty much the same other than it's really cold outside and that's confined me into my room for much of the past few few weeks. So yeah, it is cold outside when this episode airs. It'll be a week later from when we record it. So this morning is actually the Houston Marathon. And I read that the wind chill was in the 20s. And that's miserable. <laughs> so anyway, how's, uh, how's your school environment or experience with the, uh, the rise of Omicron? It's fine for me. I think I don't have that many classes. Luckily, a lot of my classes are... Uh, in person, so that's pretty nice. But I think most of my most of my peers have um, classes online, so that's pretty sad. It's funny you mentioned the Houston Marathon; they're running right outside my window right now. I can look and see them. I remember. I don't know if they're doing this this year, but two years ago when I was first here and they were doing it for the first time, there's this Episcopalian church almost right across the street from where I am. And I was walking to Herman Park a few years ago when they were doing the Houston Marathon. And out front was a priest. And everybody who was running by, he was like throwing holy water on them. So uh, I hope he's not doing that today because it's probably (laughs) probably pretty cold. But I I always think about that. Yeah, the runners may not appreciate that this morning. I... uh... (laughs) <laughs> no kidding. I ran the Houston Marathon uh really? 2016, maybe. And yeah, at that point it ran the perimeter of Rice. I, I assume that's still true rather than going directly through campus. Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. on the perimeter. Well, marathons are a lot of fun, man. Like crowd crowd participation. All those people who come <laughs> out, you know, your Episcopalian priests splashing holy water, people <laughs> giving like jello shots and and <laughs> And people with funny signs and giving you really? high fives and oh, it's all good. It's a fun, fun community activity, uh, but more fun when it's not, <laughs> uh, you know, 20 degrees. Anyway, I know you had a pretty, pretty busy break, a pretty, um, that's busy is not the right word, pretty uh, notable break, I guess is better. So how is that? Yeah, I, I guess it was notable. So probably not notable since so many other people had it. I had COVID at the beginning of, or about the middle of December, I'm fully vaxxed and boosted. And so my symptoms were incredibly mild. I would have probably just thought I had the end of the semester, um, you know, crud or whatever. But, uh, but anyway, I knew some folks who had been diagnosed. And so I was going to go see my folks and I wanted to make sure I didn't have it. So I got tested and sure enough. So I quarantined for a while, but then once that was over, I hopped on a plane and went to Disney. <laughs> so <laughs> if you can imagine two two more different situations, uh, isolation and quarantine, and then the chaos that is Disney after Christmas. That was a lot of fun. And of course, it felt like I was swimming in a Petri dish, <laughs> but, but a Petri dish of magic, magical <laughs> experience. So yeah, there's that. I guess the only other thing that's notable, and this will have run its course by the time this episode airs, but... The school that I teach at is performing the musical Les Miserables, <laughs> and the director, <laughs> are you ready for this? The director 
asked if I would oh be the my bishop. Gosh. Uh, and if you're from... No way. Yeah, yeah. So if you're that's insane. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So if, so people not yeah, so for people not familiar with the with the story, uh and I think I talked about Lamez in a, the story in a previous episode. But um but it's a story that's meant a lot to me in my life and the the scene where the bishop gives the candlesticks to Valjean has has always been an incredibly moving uh, part of that story for me. And uh so I get to be the bishop and and the funny thing is I, I'm going to sing. <laughs> I'm going to sing by myself, not in a chorus, but by myself in front of people. It's only 16 <laughs> lines, so it's it's pretty short. But anyway, for the first time in my life, I will sing solo. That's so hilarious. anyway, Les Mis. Yeah. Please yeah, invite it's so much me to fun. that when, um, when, when you perform that. I'm I'm excited. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll send you the dates. I mean, literally, I'm on stage for two minutes. Um <laughs> because it's such a short scene. But of course, the most important, <laughs> most pivotal. Yeah, it is really, really important. Without the bishop, yeah, there's no rest of the story, you know. <laughs> okay, everybody. So we are beginning a new series on this podcast. This is going to be a three-episode series on the topic of consciousness, uh, or what is in philosophy sometimes called the mind-body problem. So in this particular episode, we're going to talk uh, like an introduction of the subject, and then we're going to talk about the first sort of viewpoint on it, and that's called dualism. Then in the second episode, we're going to look at the perspective of materialism and then panpsychism. And then on episode three, we're very excited to have on our show one of the hosts of the Panpsychast, and is coming out with a new book here in a few weeks. It's called Philosophers on Consciousness, Talking About the Mind. We will have Jack Symes on with us uh, for the third episode of this series. So anyway, that is where we're going with this. So let's get going, Andrew. Our topic is consciousness. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, what, what is consciousness? What is the mind? And what is the body? Oh my gosh, you, you asked some pretty, three huge questions that none of which I have great answers to. I think I'll start with what is consciousness? I guess we can start there. I think it's very difficult. It's obviously very difficult to define what consciousness is because I'm saying it's difficult to define because I don't think anybody's sufficiently defined what consciousness is. That's why philosophers of mind still have jobs. <laughs> I think if we think about consciousness, how we experience it, it's probably a little bit easier to grasp. So I'll say right now, I think I'm conscious. I'm pretty sure I am. And I think that, you know, that has a variety of kind of attributes that come with it. One is probably awareness. Two is that I can interact with an environment in a way that I choose. And I think three something that helps when thinking about consciousness is kind of um, looking at a negative view of what consciousness is in the sense that let's think about someone who's maybe sleeping or in a coma. Many people would say that these are not conscious beings. You know, there's going to be other episodes where we talk about ethics behind that, ethics of consciousness and stuff like that. But I think uh, when we're just looking at what consciousness might be, we can use this kind of negative approach of what it's not when we look at someone in some maybe a coma or a sleep and how that's different from us. So Mr. Parsons, what's what might be a little bit of a difference between uh, someone who's in a coma or someone who's asleep versus like kind of how we are right now? So I think of when I think of consciousness and like what it is, and this goes to your point, it's like the summation of our feelings, our thoughts, um, it's even really our personality in some ways, but ultimately it's sensory experience, right? So sensory experience, what we see, smell, touch, feel, and, and, and we take that data and we do something with it and we call that consciousness or rather that creates consciousness. And so someone who is sleeping or someone who is in a coma, they are not conscious, right? They are, uh, or we assume that they're not conscious. Now, I don't want to get into like dreams and subconscious and all that sort of stuff. But they're not having like what we would consider a direct sensory experience. Like right now I'm looking at you on the computer screen and I'm, I have sounds in my ears and I have 
uh, taste on my tongue from the coffee I'm drinking and all these types of things create this experience that is consciousness. And so in a way, like if you think about it in the in this perspective, in a way consciousness is experience, right? Like we, we can't really escape consciousness. So kind of what I want to do with this this introduction here is kind of create a um a sort of appreciation for just the weirdness that is consciousness because consciousness is like ubiquitous like you can't escape consciousness now we can talk about whether or not we're conscious in what ways but like even that involves consciousness so it's one of those things that we don't think about often because it literally is everywhere and everything and once we so we assume when we die our consciousness ends then you might say our, our experience, at least as the human beings that, that we are right now, that experience ends as well. So in a way, consciousness is existence or consciousness is experience. So I kind of went off a little rant there. Uh, what, how does that interact with, like, say, the body, Andrew? Like, is is consciousness part of the body? Do, can we go back for a second and talk about the mind really quickly? Oh, absolutely. I think... A big concept in, well, obviously philosophy of mind, uh, but in talking about consciousness too is just talking about the mind and kind of what the mind is. And I think this will help for our discussion in a few minutes too. But let me r really quickly pay homage to the uh, people on this topic who came before us. The I'm trying to, trying to do all of this without uh, saying ancient philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's important. I think it's um, thinking about how they thought about it really helps understanding how this topic has changed and will provide different ways of thinking about it, too. So if we go back, you know, a long time ago, this is not a new question that's been uh, raised recently in the past 200 years or so. No, not at all. Uh, philosophers have been thinking about this question since the beginning of philosophy going back to Plato and people even before him. And so I think that it's really important to to think about, you know, because we can't just discredit them as much as a lot of people would like to just because they're old. We can't do that. And so when they talk about uh, the mind, they use a different word, obviously, because they're Greek. Uh, they use the word suke, which has inspired the root of the word psychology um, and suke is often translated in, in some ways as soul. So they think, they're thinking about it that way. I think it's helpful to think about it as soul when you're thinking about how it's kind of changed throughout the history of thought. Uh, because that same word suke is now often translated in modern thought as mind. So it really hasn't changed that much over time. So if you reflect back on one of our episodes where we talked about Plato on the soul, you know, we can also think about that as Plato on the mind, too, where he's thinking about this uh, soul as a kind of soul or mind as this uh, intangible thing that is separate from our body. And I think that's a, a good thing to think about as we preface this episode. The mind, one, has been studied as a recap because I know this has been long. Uh, one, the mind's been studied for a long time by philosophers uh, and to really what the mind, soul, whatever you want to call it, has a lot of different properties and a lot of different ways of thinking about it. Yeah, that's great. You know, the the thing that's so interesting about the mind, right, is is that the mind is is you. And this is one of the reasons I think studying consciousness or the mind-body problem is so important is because really in a way your mind or your consciousness is you, it's your personality. It's you as an individual, right? And so we can think about, you know, going back to the roots of that word that you mentioned, uh, we can think about the soul in terms of sort of a religious context, which a lot of people might immediately do. And in that, like, that is somehow in an essential way, you. But also for non-religious adherents, uh, the idea of mind, like it doesn't really change that much. The, the idea of mind is, is still something that's specifically and uniquely you. I think the only thing it shifts, if we're using both those terms, soul and mind, in sort of a modern context, the only difference is that the idea of a soul in a religious context, that your soul will transcend the death of the physical body, whereas people who are not religious 
will say that this unique thing that is you, that is consciousness, that is mind, once you once your body dies, well, that consciousness does come to an end. And and so that's one of the reasons I think it's such an important topic. We always say on this program that we want to, the philosophy that we put forth, we want it to be practical and important for people's lives. And we have another, a couple of other reasons that we think consciousness is an important topic. But like what you said, Andrew, made me just think about that aspect of it. Like the, like the mind is you, right? Yeah. Um, which which is like why it's so hard to study, right? Consciousness. Yeah, I mean, like, if you think of these famous uh, psychologists like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, if I'm saying that right, like all of these people are concerned with this study of the mind being the self. Another, I think Suke directly translated, and this this definitely applies, is uh, Suke, I think, directly means life. Mm. If we're thinking about, okay, the mind, what is the mind? Some people would say it's life. And I think uh, I think that's an important way of thinking about it because it's it seems pretty pretty true. Yeah, and so that brings up the next issue, which is well, okay, so if the mind is us, then what is the body? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> right. And and how do how do those two things work with each other? Right. Now, this is a topic that can also get very scientific, and uh, I think Andrew and I both have expressed that we are not the most. Uh, scientifically knowledgeable nope. people on this matter. And there are some subjects in philosophy that get incredibly scientific, such as like cosmology and the origins of the universe and all that sort of stuff where, uh, at least uh, from my experience, I can only speak very peripherally about that. But, you know, when you talk about the mind and the body, we start talking about neuroscience and we talk about what happens inside the brain, the physical thing that is the brain versus the non-physical thing at least according to dualists, uh, the non-physical thing that is the mind. And uh, there will be some points where we uh, talk about some scientific things. And, uh, you know, following our good friend Kierkegaard, we'll take a (laughs) leap of faith that we're (laughs) we're saying those things right. But uh, yeah, the body and the mind, it's really a, a fascinating concept. Well, I think you're raising a good point by saying how complicated this is. And it's really that there's kind of a lot of problems that occur when we're trying to study consciousness. So what are a few of these problems? Well, (laughs) it's hard to know exactly where to start, like in a sort of organized fashion. So I'll just launch in and say, say, first off, it's hard to study something you can't observe. Like this is probably the biggest difficulty with consciousness. Like I can't show you consciousness. I can't like take my consciousness outside of my body and put it on a table and say, let's talk about this thing. Uh, Let's observe it. Let's uh, let's let's quantify aspects of consciousness, because as far as we know, at least from a dualist sort of perspective, like you can't weigh consciousness. You can't measure it and see how large it is. You, You can't you can't approach the problem of consciousness from the from the traditional sort of perspective that we carry out scientific inquiry right which is from a very quantitative standpoint where we do want to gather data that we can that we can look at and analyze and try to answer hypotheses with conclusions based based on the collection of that data uh, there, there's not much we can do with that other than cracking someone's head well not literally cracking someone's head open but but doing things such as brain scans, MRIs, things of that nature that can measure brain activity and show what's going on, at least in a physical way, what's going on in the brain. But that still doesn't have anything to do with the qualitative aspect of what we call inner subjective experience. So you want to say something about maybe inner subjective experience, Andrew? The subjectivity of experience that we kind of all uh, go through on a daily basis whenever we are kind of just experiencing the world, right? So take a lemon, for example. When we're trying to study a lemon, we can definitely quantify a lemon in some ways, right? Like we can talk about uh, the size of the lemon. We can talk, you know, we can weigh it, right? We can uh, put it on a scale. We can measure it. Uh, We can describe where the lemon is. Is it on a tree? You know, whatever in that way. But also when we... (laughs) When we can study a lemon, we can also talk about some characteristics of it that are much more difficult to describe when we are trying to come to know 
what a lemon is, right? So we can talk about, you know, a lemon is yellow, but, you know, in that comes some more philosophical questions of, you know, like the yellow that I experience is, is different than the yellow that Mr. Parsons experiences or even the person next door to me. Another thing too, right, like is if I taste a lemon, I really like lemons. If I like squeeze them out into my water, I like that. And then I like to stick the lemon into my mouth and peel off the, I don't know what that's called. I don't know. <laughs> the rind. <laughs> the, the rind. <laughs> Mr. Parsons is looking at me in disgust right now for, I mean. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't see it. But I really like that for some reason. I don't know what your thoughts on this are. I'm sure he doesn't do this because I, I don't think I've met or, ever met anyone who's felt that same way. So I'm just going to guess. But yeah, uh, uh, there's there's a level of subjectivity that comes to to knowing um, something like a lemon, and I think this has kind of two implications. First is okay uh, if we're taking something that is one impossible to to if we're taking something like the mind, the soul, life, whatever you want to call it, and it's impossible for us to define it or look at it or uh, study it quantitatively, which is in probably all cases much easier to do than qualify something, then, you know, the the even subjectivity of experiencing daily life is going to make studying consciousness even that more difficult. I think this kind of goes on a second, my second point goes on a related tangent is that, you know, even if the way that we experience the world in something so small as something like a lemon or a watermelon or whatever you want to say about it, the subjectivity that comes with trying to qualify that for each individual raises problems with it in its own, right? So another, a couple of other examples to kind of point this out, right? Like, so let's, you know, let's take water, for example, like we can talk about the molecular structure of water, right? That's a, a quantitative way to talk about water. But qualitatively, we can't talk about like the subjective experience of the wetness of water, right? How water feels to us uh, in, in special in other ways, right? We all experience water, the wetness of it in sort of a different way. But another one might be pain, right? Like, for instance, you know, if, if I'm having a kidney stone and scientists could look at what's happening with my nervous system and how that's communicating with my brain and why that indicates that I'm like having pain. And, and you know, uh, you, we've all experienced this, you know, you go to the doctor and you have something wrong with you, something's hurting, and, and they tell you to try to explain the pain or tell what it feels like. And, you know, we use things uh, like you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much pain are you in? Or, or we kind of have like these emojis, right, of people's faces. And, you know, one looks really happy and sunny and the other, other end of the spectrum, it's like red and a angry and hurting. You know, uh, it, it's impossible to express something like pain in the way that you are experiencing it. We use metaphors to help, you know, we say like, oh, it's a sharp pain or it or it feels like barbed wire is wrapped around my kidney or, or it burns, you know, or something like that. It's, so this is what I mean, like when we talk about the inner subjective experience, right? Like, like, again, from a quantitative standpoint, we can show all that activity happening in the brain. But like, as far as experiencing or, or understanding what your pain might be like, uh, that's, that's impossible. And that's, that's what makes, that's what makes studying consciousness very difficult. And I think a problem that also underlines this, or at least a school that underlines our entire way of thinking about philosophy of mind is epistemology or theory of knowledge or um, the study of knowledge. How we think about what we know is going to be extremely important in our study, in our inquiry into philosophy of the mind or what is consciousness or whatever, because However, we approach our study to philosophy of mind, something that underlying it is how we think about how we know things, what, what, what is there to know. So a skeptic, someone who's going to be denying all of their, or, or denying is not fair, maybe, someone who's very skeptical about things that they know is going to be taking an entirely different approach to this question 
than someone who is rather very accepting on information. And I have an example in a minute, but I want to kick the can back to you, Mr. Parsons, uh, on this topic, because I know I know you teach epistemology. You have an entire class dedicated to this that uh, some students have to take. So, uh, yeah, I want to get your, your opinion on the topic. Yeah, it's really hard to talk about the construction of knowledge and how we arrive at knowing things. If If everything is entirely subjective, some things must be knowable and some things are known, right, obviously. But this dichotomy between empiricism and maybe rationalism is a big one and important for the study of knowledge, the study of epistemology. Whereas rationalists would rely on things such as mathematics to explain experience, you know, your empiricist would would counter that with, yeah, well, yes, surely we can know some things with mathematics, obviously, but we can't know a, about a thing unless we know about experiencing that thing as well. Uh, mathematics can't explain romantic love, things like that. Uh, <laughs> mathematics might be able to explain like, you know, how, or science might be able to explain how, you know, the sour taste of a lemon interacts with our taste buds and brain chemistry and all that sort of stuff. But at, this, at the same time, like the experience of, uh, of tasting that lemon is very different than, than what we're looking at, you know, from that quantitative rational standpoint. Like how what you're hoping for, Andrew? <laughs> no, no, that's that's exactly right. No, that's 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 perfect. And I think a topic that's parallel to this topic that's extremely different, but uh, has some similarities, and is a preview for future attractions. Is if we're thinking about philosophy of religion and God, epistemology plays such an important part in every philosophical, like ev- everything in philosophy is intertwined. Epistemology. Uh, is intertwined with ethics, and ethics is intertwined with political philosophy. But epistemology is really a backbone of of things, and especially when thinking about questions about God and thinking about questions about consciousness too. Both are very difficult fields to study. Both, some would say, are impossible to know about. Both, some would say, there's no proof for. Both, some would say, there's nothing physical to, to study about them. And, and so we should be very skeptical about both. And some would say we should just deny both of them. I, I don't want to talk too much about philosophy of religion because that's a topic for a, a later in the season. Uh, but I do want to make a differentiation between uh, philosophy of mind and philosophy of religion that I think is important. And some will disagree with me. And even I disagree with myself on this point. But I think philosophy of mind, consciousness, uh, the mind, the soul, whatever, that's something that we've kind of experienced every single day from the day we were, well, something we've experienced for a very long time, at least. It's something that we're experiencing very much of. uh, Consciousness is a fundamental part of our being. And so we do have some knowledge to it in that way. And some would say that's something that differs from philosophy of religion, now, what, what I think about on that topic and what I think Mr. Parsons thinks about that topic is kind of irrelevant, but I think it's, uh, it's important. Uh, so all the things that, that you've mentioned just now and, and everything else we've been talking about the last 25 minutes really leads to this issue of like why the mind-body problem is, well, called a problem. So we can't get away from this next phrase, and anyone who's familiar with the philosophy of mind or consciousness will be familiar with this phrase. In the 1990s, a philosopher, David Chalmers, uh, called consciousness the hard problem. The, the idea was that, you know, say 100 years ago, all this new science was developing, ways to look at the brain, neuroscience, that the belief was that we would finally come up with an explanation of how consciousness arises from the physical brain, right? And after decades of working on that problem, it doesn't seem that we're that much closer. We certainly know much more of how the the brain works, but how it gives rise to consciousness, subjective experience, we're, we're still not quite sure. And so David Chalmers coined this phrase. I don't know if he meant to coin it. It's become so famous in philosophy of mind. But uh, but the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, we thought we would have a solution. We don't. And that's allowed certain new consciousness theories to arise again, uh, such as we'll mention in the next episode, panpsychism, which is an idea that literally everything has consciousness. 
or degree of consciousness. But the last thing I, I do want to bring out before we go to break here, uh, another important reason of like why the study of consciousness is important uh, has to do with free will. The idea that we are able to make choices on our own because most people view free will as a good, the freedom to make choice as a good. And if the mind does result from the brain and the brain is the, the things that occur in the brain, which is a physical event in our universe, it has to be associated with what we call the law of causation. That might suggest that everything we do, all the choices that we make with our mind, is simply determined by previous causes that happened before, and that negates free will. And so there might be a lot to wrap your mind around uh, if you're unfamiliar with that argument. But but the other reason I, for me, consciousness is important is uh, is it does have to do with free will. That's the sound of money. Fresh printed money, money, money. We're getting ready to launch into the second half of the episode. But before we do that, uh, this season, boy, we've been so fortunate to uh, to attract some some sponsors this year. And every episode, you know, we'll we'll do like like a lot of podcasts do, right? You know, we'll we'll acknowledge those sponsorships. So we're so fortunate. Uh, first of all, would like to thank our first sponsor, uh, and that's Nietzsche's Mustache Wax. That's right, Nietzsche's Mustache Wax, helping tame the wild facial hair of discerning gentlemen since 1862. <laughs> thank you. Nietzsche's mustache wax. <laughs> and we'd also like to give a huge shout out to this week's other sponsor, Kierkegaard's Jeweler. That's right. Kierkegaard's Jeweler, refashioning rings from failed engagements into personal symbols of existential anguish since 1841. Oh, man. The fact that we uh, attracted a jeweler <laughs> for this episode, I mean, I think it really speaks to the audience that we're uh, that we're that we're attracting. But anyway, of course, everyone, our lovely listeners, uh, you can actually sponsor us by quickly rating our podcast and perhaps even leaving a review. It is a pleasing aroma to the algorithmic gods and helps open door philosophy pop up more frequently in search results and recommendations to, to other listeners. Yeah, that's right. Additionally, we're planning on a future episode based on listener questions. Yeah, yeah. So here in the next month, we would love for you to send us your nagging philosophical questions, like, you know, what's the meaning of life or something, uh, to us. at uh, There's a couple of ways you can get a hold of us, uh, opendoorphilosophy at gmail.com, if email's better for you. Or you can hit us up on our Twitter accounts. We have, there's an Open Door Philosophy Twitter or you can just access me directly at D underscore Parsonage, P-A-R-S-O-N-A-G-E. Or we also have an Instagram that you can send us our questions on to as well. I was just, I was just, <laughs> I was just thinking, I have not checked the Open Door Philosophy uh, Gmail in a oh, while. Oh, I check it occasionally. Oh, you check it yeah, occasionally? Yeah, I probably did in the last week or two. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We have a uh, sharper uh, sharper auto insurance. Heck yeah! Providing uh, switch to car insurance. Yeah, very good. Sharper auto insurance is a big fan of the program. I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe when we hit fifty uh, episodes, you know, we'll start a Patreon or something. <laughs> but you know, that's at least a year away. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we could use the yeah. money to buy better mics. That would be amazing. <laughs> All right, so uh, today we're going to talk for the rest of the episode. Well, I want to mention like what the major theories are related to mind body, and then we'll talk about dualism. So, uh, so here are like the basic three major theories related to mind body, and there are a number of like sub theories associated with each of these. But the big ones are the first is dualism. So, if you can imagine in your mind uh, a picture and we're drawing circles, dualism suggests that the mind and the body are in completely separate from each other. So if you're drawing a diagram, you draw two circles and they do not overlap with each other. You have mind and you have body. And so there's a long history that supports this idea. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The second view is materialism or sometimes called physicalism. So this is a very straightforward biological explanation for the mind. And that's very simple that 
the brain, the physical thing that is the brain, the mush that's inside your skull, it is responsible for giving rise to the mind. The mind results from it. All of that's based on the law of causation, that every event that occurs in experience has a cause. Therefore, the mind must be something that is caused and it is caused by the brain. The third, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is a is it's an old theory actually, but it's it's regaining interest in the philosophical world, and that's called panpsychism, and that is the idea that everything has a degree of consciousness. Now, degree is a very important word in that statement, but it's the idea that everything has a degree of consciousness. Therefore, existence is consciousness. But we'll get much deeper into that idea when we hit it next episode. Okay, so those are the big three arguments. So we're going to spend the rest of the episode looking at dualism. So we're going to look at arguments for and then arguments against. Who knows, it may get more jumbled than that, but that's our idea. Arguments for. So the first is sort of an intuitive argument. Andrew, could you walk us through kind of what that means? Sure. Stop me if I get this wrong at all. Mm -hmm. The intuitive argument is kind of basing off of our everyday experiences it kind of seems when we're really thinking about, you know, how we exist in the world, how we think that, you know, there is something that is a mind. And is the, is the idea that the mind is separate from the body intuitively? Yeah. And the idea is that it is kind of intuitively makes sense that the mind is separate from the body. Is that is that do you want to add anything else on top of that, Mr. Parsons? Yeah. I mean, if I can argue for it, it's the idea that it's just so plainly obvious that the mind is something separate for, for all kinds of reasons. One would be that, say, we're not really in, totally in control of our bodies. For instance, if, if I am having a kidney stone, I can't use my mind and be like, ah, stop. You know, it, <laughs> it, it seems like the mind in that case is very separate from the body. Like I can't influence my body with my mind, right? Uh, so that's kind of an intuitive argument, but we use all kind of all kinds of language in our in our daily experience, you know, colloquialisms, idioms that at least suggest that there is some belief that there is a separation between mind and body. You know, we say things when we're acting when we're acting ridiculous or something. You know, some people are like, "Hey, stop! Just use your head," you know, and that and that's like, ah, okay, I, I need to like stop what my body's doing because it's you know it's reacting to something in a sort of a biological evolutionary way you know i need to use my mind i need to use my rational faculty to uh, to stop myself from what i'm doing and in that way it sort of seems like we are that the mind and body are separate so that's that argument right i don't know it's a strong argument but it's the idea that you know it just seems plainly obvious but you said plato sort of supports that in some way yeah Pla so plato's coming from this tradition that kind of assumes that there's something like a soul or a spirit that exists I don't know if Plato really does a great job of spelling out why there is a soul. I really don't think that he argues for that. So I think that that's why it's kind of similar to, to this intuitive argument. I think Plato would say something like this, that, and I think this connects with the intuitive argument, that when a person dies, there's a body that's left behind, but what changes when the body dies? Like there has to be some kind of change, right? And it seems like thing, that body is no longer thinking. And so I think that would be, that, that's kind of where his thought on this process is. Plato believes the soul kind of animates the body. Uh, the soul is life and the soul gives the body life. So it's kind of like, think about the soul as a kind of like engine for the body. The soul is, has, the, he says this in the Phaedo, I think, but it's the soul um, has the property of life and it kind of, it has the form of life. The soul has the form of life. And it's kind of emanating that form of life to the body. It's a very interesting argument. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty compelling, to be honest. Definitely it has a little bit of problems. But yeah, um, and then Plato, I think also something quickly to note too is that, you know, he does think the, the soul, it does not only give the body life, but it also gives the body the ability to think too. And it's really to think well. So the, the reason you're able to reason uh, is because of the soul, because of the mind. And it's divided into different parts, but that's, that's not that important. Yeah, you know, another term that, that I thought of while you're, while you're talking about that, 
well, I don't know if it's a common usage, but people are probably familiar with it. It's the term uh, a ghost in the machine, right? And that's the idea that kind of like we've been saying that there's something inside the machine that is your body. And sometimes scientifically, we think about our bodies as a machine, right? Like it's the thing that is responsible for carrying around our consciousness. You know, so therefore, when we die, that's why we need to take care of our bodies, because if our <laughs> if our body dies, then our consciousness uh, ceases to exist. Yeah. So ghosts in the machine, like, you know, for instance, you know, if I believe that my body is just strictly this house for uh, for my mind and I can manipulate this machine with my mind, for instance, I see my glasses here on the counter. I want to pick them up. I think with my consciousness, my mind that I that is my desire. I want to do that. And then the body carries it out for me. So I think that's probably also another somewhat related to the intuitive argument. Like, you know, hey, I need to pick up these glasses. I think about it. It happens. My body did it. I mean, I did it, but like the body carries it out. And I'm not saying that that is the correct <laughs> correct view, but this is why uh, some people say like, it's just plainly obvious, right? That there is this separation between these two things. <laughs> So I guess the next philosopher we want to mention sort of in this line of thinking with dualism is a 12th century. By the way, this is all very Western, like the Western tradition. So so we've got Maimonides, who's a 12th century Jewish philosopher, and he spells it out a, a little more plainly, right, than perhaps Plato did. I mean, I think you're right, Andrew. Uh, Plato kind of muddles it up when it comes to like proving a, a soul or something like that. So Maimonides has this theory which really... Descartes kind of takes and runs with. It's the idea that the body is the home of the soul and the soul guides the body. So this example I used a second ago about picking up my glasses, like that's really what Maimonides is suggesting, that the soul guides the body. So that means like the body and the unit, uh, body and the soul are one unit, but still separate. One unit, but still separate. So this is making me, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with Maimonides at all. But it sounds a little bit different from Plato because it sounds like it sounds like the body and soul are one unit here. Plato, this is really something I think that's really cool about Plato. Plato like hates the body. He thinks that the body is a piece of trash that the soul is confined to. Um, that's very <laughs> limiting to us. And uh, it's it's kind of the, the soul is the mind. I'll, I'll, I'll say it's the mind for now. The mind is something that is the most important thing because that is you. And so Plato always wants this, the mind to, um, the, basically the mind uh, is kind of burdened by the body. It's less of a home to the body. It's more of a, a prison cell. Um, and uh, the, the soul is always really longing to escape. And it does. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> After you die, it escapes. Boy, I can't help but mention also the influence of Christianity on this entire argument as well. You know, the two great influences on Western thought is uh, Greek rationalism and uh, and Christian theology, right? And so, so very similar to Plato's idea, man. Like as far as the New Testament goes, the Christians, the Christian writers, especially Paul, is very suspicious of the human body, and we see in the writings of of the Bible. Uh, especially in the New Testament, that we sort of talk about this division, like there is this idea of the soul and the body, and the body has these desires and wants, which is very similar to Plato's idea of the tripartite soul, and it should be viewed very, very cautiously and suspiciously, uh, and that it is our soul that will need to guide that. And uh, it, yeah, kind of similar to what you said, like the body is, it's kind of dirty, like it's it's not something we should, we should want to... Uh, to have a lot to do with really because it, it can lead us down very very bad roads so i think that probably the most influential person on to this mind body problem was probably descartes who we have talked about before on this podcast so long time listeners will have something to draw on and it's a plug for that episode descartes was a dualist too descartes famously said or he famously wrote i think therefore i am he's giving credence to this dualist school uh, that he's really starting. So the mind is is really what's in control, and that's what is making him who he is. It's not really the body, and the body's not really having any any control over who he is too. I don't know too much about substance dualism other than the basics. 
I think Descartes thought that the soul and the body were two different kinds of things. Yeah, the reason Descartes looms so large in in this particular argument of dualism, I mean, the, uh, people even refer to his theories as Cartesian dualism. And this cogito ergo sum, right, the, the I think, therefore I am, he arrives at this conclusion in such a logical way that it's very difficult to refute the conclusion. So just very quickly as a recap, you know, here's Descartes, he's, uh, in, he's sitting in his, <laughs> in his living room, this is his fireplace, you know, he's got some papers in his hand, he's wearing a robe, uh, you know, and he's thinking about him existing. And, you know, he goes through this whole process where he thinks about all kinds of different possibilities, you know, he might not be, he might be hallucinating and not, not really there in front of the fireplace and holding these papers in his hand. He also conceives of himself as possibly being influenced by what he called a demon, right? That was creating a, a false reality for him. And that might not be true, right? His, exer- his existence might not be true, very, very matrix-like. But then, you know, after all of these uh, ideas, you know, he comes to this conclusion. He's like, well, what I may be experiencing might not be true. And sure, a demon might be creating a false reality for me. But I am thinking about the fact that a demon could possibly be creating a false reality for me. So I can at least say, because I am thinking, I exist. But that thinking thing that he says exists is separate from the body. Because if a demon truly is creating a false reality for us, that's our body, right? But is the conscious mind that is able to think about the fact that we might be experiencing a false reality. And that, in a sort of roundabout way, proves dualism. So everything we're experiencing might be false, but we're thinking about it. And the thinking thing that is you and that is your soul, and it's separate from the body. Let me um, let me raise up something from the Plato Stanford Encyclopedia real quick, which I think does a really good job of explaining uh, Descartes' position, and I want to give it credit because I think it's a good example. So it says, Descartes thought that bodies are machines that work according to their own laws, except where there are minds interfering with it, matter proceeds deterministically in its own right. Where there are minds requiring to influence bodies, they must work by pulling levers in a piece of machinery that already has its own laws of operation. Um, and I think that encapsulates what this entire what this entire kind of dualist perspective is thinking about uh, the mind and the, uh, the mind in relation to the body. That the bo- that the mind is using the body either as kind of a place to stay temporarily or or forever. I, I guess. Um, and it's using it to kind of operate in this day-to-day world to exist. And uh, the mind's ultimately in control of the body. Or rather, a good mind is in control of its body. <laughs> well, there's your uh, virtue stoicism coming out there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so that's a great explanation, right? Like our bodies exist in a physical universe, and we understand that the that things in the physical universe must adhere to and act according to the natural laws as we understand them. And since our bodies are physical things in the universe, they are also subject to those natural laws. And then that all just continues to go towards the idea that the body is a mechanism. But from a materialist standpoint, which we'll talk about next episode, that's exactly what they're saying, except they're like, because our brains are physical things in the universe subject to these natural laws, such as laws causation, that this is the explanation for why the mind arises from the brain, because the mind is a physical thing in the universe subject to those laws. But Descartes and his crew uh, separate out that, that idea that the mind is something different. How about some arguments against dualism? So I think the the one that's most compelling to me, at least, is is every. I think we've actually talked about Phineas Gage too on this podcast. This is so funny. We're referencing uh, our old episodes so much because it's important. Philosophy builds on each on parts. But as everyone who has taken any kind of psychology class or watched probably a single YouTube video knows, Phineas Gage was this was this guy in the. I think late 1800s or early 1900s, he was working on this railroad and then some dynamite or something uh, blew up and then a like railroad uh, spike 
crashed through his head and kind of like went through his frontal lobe into his eye. But before this incident, uh, well, this is important. Uh, he survived. Before this accident took place, he is supposedly like this really nice guy who's very considerate, very empathetic, uh, just super nice to everybody. And then afterwards, he was just very miserable, uh, not not just because he had like a pipe rammed through his head. You know, he was just kind of hard to put up with. He was just completely different. That's what his family said about him. He was almost like a different person. Neuroscientists have really studied this um, effect further. So it's not just this one time kind of thing. They've seen, you know, when people's minds or sorry, when people's brains are uh, messed with in, in whatever way, sometimes they're they're totally different people. There's this surgery for people with severe kind of epilepsy where they remove a section of the brain, either where, you know, these um, the seizures where they're kind of stemming from in the brain, um, or in some cases, if the seizures are kind of unnoticed, that part of the brain will be kind of destroyed by those seizures. Um, so they'll take it out in hopes that the seizures will stop. When people come out after those surgeries, they can just be completely different people, which is really interesting. Very sad. Yeah, it is interesting. I, you know, I think the difference between, like, say, the seizure example and Phineas Gage is like, you know, the, the seizure example, the seizure is also something that occurs sure, in the sure. body as a result of, of what's going on in the brain. Whereas Phineas Gage, this is so important, like his he changes mm-hmm. as a person, like his personality is different. And we know there's been lots of like when people receive head trauma of some kind, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes uh, they people report that they are just a, a, an entirely different person, whether that's good or bad or, or whatever. They're just not the same person. And that really is kind of a knock against us. I remember this one example. I can't remember who the, who the person's name was, but uh, but they were kind of a, a recurring sexual abuser. And the person was like, I just have no control over this. And, you know, I have these urges. And so they, they did a scan of his brain and had a enlarged penal gland and they removed that. And suddenly that person didn't have those sexual mm. desires anymore. That's, you know, and, and that's like changing who the person is changing for the positive, I think in that particular case, but yeah, so that's, that's definitely a, a, an argument against this. And Phineas Gage, it's like you said, uh, is so widely known and studied. It's a perfect example of an argument against this idea. I guess the other argument that you could say is sort of against this is like the whole idea of a mind existing separate from the body is just a little woo-woo-ish, right? Like it's a little, there's too much mystery involved there for some people, right? Like the idea that, well, the question would be, okay, so so the mind doesn't arise from the brain. Where does the mind arise mm-hmm. from? Yep. That's a legitimate question because if you know if you do believe in cause that law of causation that everything has a cause, every action has a cause. That means that since the brain ex- or the mind exists, well, the mind must be caused by something. So what is that something? And if you if you can't come up with an answer to that question, you know then you just shrug your shoulders like, well, we don't know. You know the mind's yep. just a mystery. Yep. 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 And so I think that's really just kind of the end of those arguments against there's probably other ones, but that's dualism in a, in a nutshell. And, you know, you can't talk about these other theories without referencing back to dualism, which is kind of why we talked about it first. So we'll have more to say about dualism in future episodes. And like I said, next week, we'll be talking about the views of materialism and panpsychism. So do join us for that episode. It'll come out two weeks after this one debuts. But that's it for our main part of our episode. But now... Rather than the quote corner, although we will visit the quote corner from time to time for sure, uh, this week, let's go see what's on the bookshelf. Okay, so new segment on the show, actually an old segment. (laughs) We used to talk about books every single episode, and it took so long uh, that it ended up taking up, you know, a third of the episode. So we cut that, but we had feedback from people that they really did enjoy hearing uh, about the types of books we were reading. And so we wanted to incorporate that back into the program. So let's see what's on the bookshelf. Andrew, what have you been reading recently? Yep. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. I've been, I've had this on my, in my library for so long and um, I've always wanted to read it, but uh, never had the chance. And then one of my classes I'm taking assigned it. It's 
Vasari's The Lives of the Artists. It's basically this book about every famous Renaissance painter known, I guess. It's it's written by this contemporary artist and the first art historian, I think. And it's basically like he Vasari was interacting with all these famous people like uh, Leonardo, uh, Michelangelo, Raphael. So it's really cool to have that uh, perspective. And, and it's kind of like a little biography about, I think Vasari, when he says the lives of the artist, he's referencing Plutarch's parallel lives, which is pretty cool. But it's a really interesting book. This something that I'm really interested in right now, and um, maybe a preview of coming attractions, but we'll see, is uh, this influence uh, on the rediscovery of ancient philosophy on Florence. And I think that's really cool. And so when, when I'm reading this book, I'll connect this to philosophy some way. All of these artists from back then are thinking about their art as a as a purpose of kind of giving back to giving back to God. So I was thinking about, yeah, they're 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 giving back to God. They're using their gifts, their function in this world in the best way they can. And it's something they're very uh, they're very aware of. Like Michelangelo and uh, Botticelli, for sure, are these two very religious thinkers who are skilled in uh, at least a little bit of theology. And that's not only ever present in their art. You know, they have these theological advisors, but it's um, philosophy is ever present in just the way that they're thinking about life in general. So that's really cool. That sounds awesome. Are you you're currently reading it right now? Yep. I'm reading probably, I think we have to read a, we have to read probably a few for every class. I'm in this uh, class. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm in this Renaissance uh, art history class that is really cool. But uh, yeah. Oh, sounds fascinating. Yeah. I want to take your classes. I get jealous. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, the book, it's not what I'm currently reading, but what I'm currently reading is Beast and Man by Mary Midgley, which is about human behavior and things such as that. But the book, I've read a number of books since our last episode, and the one I wanted to point out was a book called Transcendentalism and the Cultivation of the Soul. So if you've listened to the podcast, you know I love uh, some transcendentalism. And the, the, the thing why books like this are important is... When it comes to these philosophies of life, whether it's existentialism or stoicism or whatever, like no one person is like, okay, here's what transcendentalism is. With the exception of maybe, you know, William James wrote a book called Pragmatism, but it's not like that was the end of the conversation. Many pragmatists came past, uh, came after him. And, you know, when you take the summation of all that work, you have something you call pragmatism, right? So with transcendentalism, I mean, you have so many people that were influential in that movement, but no one writes like a definitive, this is what transcendentalism is, you know? And so books like Transcendentalism and the Cultivation of the Soul, by the way, uh, by the author Barry M. Andrews, takes many of the ideas from your thinkers and puts them together in kind of one volume. It's like, okay, if you're interested in how transcendentalism can cultivate the soul, as the title says, this book kind of takes all of that writing and, and, and cobbles it together. And uh, and so you do sort of have a, a more definitive text. You can see this with a, a whole lot of books out there. There's plenty of books on like, what is stoicism? Uh, what is existentialism? And those authors do the same thing. They take all those thinkers from that tradition, and they put them all together in a book, try to find some common themes so anyway, Transcendentalism and Cultivation of the Soul, if you're interested in Transcendentalism, I highly recommend it. It was a really insightful read. All right, everybody, that's going to be about it for today's episode. Yeah, we thank you so much for listening, as always, and certainly passing along Open Door Philosophy to your friends. You can find more about the show, episode resources, and our books at our website at opendoorphilosophy.com. Yeah, and engage with us online at Twitter at uh, D underscore Parsonage uh, and our Open Door Philosophy Instagram as well. We'd once again like to thank Kevin McLeod for uh, allowing us to use his music. As always, I think his music's really fun. And so uh, season two is going to be a blast just because of that. Uh, So go check him out online. Okay, that's going to do it. We'll see you guys next time. And remember, when your life is in need of some philosophy, the door is always open. Thank you.